You're tuned to the Steve Donahue Show on CPL Radio, your one-stop daily source for Steve's take on the world of books. And now your host, the book critic who literally reads everything, Steve Donahue. Greetings, fellow patrons of the Cedarburg Public Library, and welcome back to the Steve Donahue Show, where we discuss bookish views, news, and reviews with wild abandon. (laughs) Our bit of book news this time around is slightly old, uh, but it's no less outrage-inducing for all that. Earlier this summer, the Game of Thrones fantasy author George R. R. Martin hosted the 2020 Hugo Awards uh, online, of course, uh, one of the most important events in the science fiction calendar. And there were problems. <laughs> there were oh so many problems. <laughs> Martin mispronounced the names of many of the nominees and winners, and he spent time windily reminiscing about a couple of towering figures in the SF world who, unbeknownst to Martin, had already been, like, totally canceled uh, by the social justice virtue signal mob. One of those towering figures was the great editor John Campbell, who died in 1971 and who was awarded a retro Hugo this year. Um, The Hugos didn't exist when Campbell was in his prime, and these authors do love their time travel. (laughs) Uh, He was given the award for his genre-shaping stint as editor of Astounding Stories, during which he discovered, encouraged, shaped, and published, and let's not forget paid, dozens of the authors who went on to create the world of science fiction that we know today. The Hugos honored this gigantic achievement by renaming an award after Campbell. That is, until author Jeanette Jeanette Ng spoke at last year's Hugo and railed against Campbell's racism right before uncorking some of her own, pointing out that, quote, through his editorial control of astounding science fiction, he is responsible for setting a tone of science fiction that still haunts the genre to this day. Stale, sterile, male, white. Uh, Not only did the Hugo people, in knee-quivering terror at being hashtagged on Twitter, quickly rename the award, It's now called the Astounding Award. But they actually gave Ng a Hugo this year for her her unhinged, foul-mouthed, and profoundly entitled speech last year, condemning one of the founders of her genre and the man most responsible for the fact that she currently gets paid more than a nickel a word. It need hardly be said that George R.R. Martin will never be asked to emcee the Hugos or any other literary award again in his lifetime. And more, with the renaming of his award and the honoring of Ng's speech with an award of its own, John Campbell has been effectively erased from the genre he did more than virtually any other editor to create. It, of course, got me thinking about Campbell, who was, you know, let's get this out of the way immediately, indeed a virulently outspoken racist. This isn't meant to validate or excuse that childishly boneheaded, stale, sterile, white male baloney, but there's no avoiding it. For all his skill at getting the best out of his incredible stable of writers, Campbell was somebody guaranteed to offend. As Alec Navala Lee put it in his terrific 2018 book, Astounding, for a man who took pride in questioning the beliefs of others, Campbell's opinions on race were horrifyingly unexamined. This raises all kinds of questions about the worth or even the possibility of separating the art from the artist, particularly since his editorial skill isn't Campbell's only claim to fame. He was also a writer. True, he was a god-awful writer, but even a blind pig can find a truffle now and then. And oh boy, did Campbell hit the truffle jackpot with his 1938 novella Who Goes There? A wonderfully workable story about a group of researchers in the Antarctic who uncover a derelict alien spacecraft with a surviving alien on board. Another, an otherworldly creature who can assume the appearance and memory and the very identity of any poor sap it consumes. The story was schlock dramatic gold and it's been adapted no fewer than three times for the big screen. First, in 1951, with James Arness as a, uh, shall we say, less than convincing alien. Uh, Then, most famously, in 1982, in John Carpenter's hysterically watchable movie, The Thing. And then again in 2011, in a Thing prequel that approximately 14 people saw. Uh, The story's combination of paranoia and xenophobia, of zealously guarding yourself against an enemy who may be you, maps so fascinatingly onto Campbell's own psychology that it's probably no wonder it works so well as drama. I saw each one of those movies in the theater, and I couldn't get enough. In fact, 
I was recently fascinated by the story all over again when I reread Pete Watts' science fiction short story called The Things, in which he reimagines Campbell's original tale only told from the point of view of the shape-shifting alien. In Watts' story, this alien is millennia old and has led an impossibly rich existence by morphing its being in order to commune with all the life forms it encounters. And all of those life forms have shared with it one bedrock similarity. They, too, were essentially shapeshifters, fluid beings for whom constant biological change was synonymous with living. Only in humans does this alien encounter beings who are locked into their own bodies, imprisoned in their own cells, and it takes the alien most of the story simply to understand what it sees as a horrifying evolutionary mistake. The realization dawns most forcefully when the alien realizes why human nervous systems seem to feed up the spinal column to one particular organ, one organ the alien finds more disturbing than anything it's encountered in eons of life. This is how Watson writes it. Here's the quote from, uh, from the short story. It was malformed and incomplete. That's the organ that we're talking about. But its essentials were clear enough. It looked like a great wrinkled tumor, like cellular competition gone wild, as though the very processes that defined life had somehow turned against it. It was obscenely vascularized. It must have consumed oxygen and nutrients far out of proportion to its mass. I could not see how anything like that could even exist, how it could have reached that size without being outcompeted by more efficient morphologies. Nor could I imagine what it did. But then I began to look with new eyes at these offshoots, these biped shapes my own cells had so scrupulously and unthinkingly copied when they reshaped me for this world. Unused to inventory, why catalog body parts that only turn into other things at the slightest provocation, I really saw, for the first time, that swollen structure atop each body, so much larger than it should be, a bony hemisphere into which a million ganglionic interfaces could fit with room to spare. Every offshoot had one. Each piece of biomass carried one of these huge, twisted clots of tissue. I realized something else, too. The eyes, the ears of my dead skin had fed into this thing before its removal. A massive bundle of fibers ran along the skin's longitudinal axis right up the middle of the endoskeleton, leading directly into the dark, sticky cavity where the growth had rested. That misshapen structure had been wired into the whole skin, like some kind of somacognitive interface, but vastly more massive. It was almost as if... No. That was how it worked. That was how these empty skins moved of their own volition, why I'd found no other networks to integrate. There it was, no distributed, not distributed throughout the body, but balled up into itself, dark and dense and insisted. I had found the ghost in these machines. I felt sick. I had shared my flesh with thinking cancer. <laughs> the Things does an uncanny job of setting who goes there on its head. I can't say for certain what John Campbell would have made of it, but I bet he would have paid good money for it. Uh... And, well, on that slightly rueful note, we'll conclude this episode of The Steve Donahue Show. But I'll be back tomorrow on a decidedly more upbeat note, even if it kills me. <laughs> the Steve Donahue Show is a production of CPL Radio, a service of the Cedarburg Public Library located in Cedarburg, Wisconsin.